Hi, everybody. It's Philip Van Dusen at Brand Design Masters Podcast. Today, I am here with Alan Adamson. I'm really excited because Alan and I actually used to work um, in different cities, but at the same agency, Landor Associates. And Adam is a noted industry expert in all disciplines of branding. He's worked with a broad spectrum of consumer and corporate businesses in industries ranging from packaged goods and technology to healthcare and financial services, hospitality, and entertainment. He's the co-founder and managing partner of a marketing strategy and activation firm, Metaforce. He's also an NYU Stern adjunct professor and the author of multiple books on branding, all of which I highly recommend, Brand Simple, Brand Digital, The Edge, 50 Tips from Brands That Lead, and his most current book, Shift Ahead, How the Best Companies Stay Relevant in a Fast-Changing World. And with that, I welcome Alan. Thanks for having me, Philip. It's fun to uh, work with you, quote unquote, again, um, uh, and uh, chat for a little bit. Absolutely. So why don't you give our listeners a little idea of kind of um, a little bit of background on Alan? Well, um, I I thought I was going to be a filmmaker when I came out of college, uh, and I made lots of uh, films in college, but the people I was... Uh, work you know, in school was were more talented and more committed. They were doing it twenty four seven. I only did it while in class. And so, uh, coming out of that, I went into making small films uh, in advertising. <laughs> and I wasn't really making them. I was uh, behind the scenes in account management. So I started my career in advertising. And what I liked about that business, and which I still like about the business I'm in today, is that uh, it's the intersection between problem solving that's not linear, you don't get to add up the numbers and get to an answer, it's more conceptual, and it's the intersection between business and creativity. Uh, you need creativity to be successful in many of the things I enjoy doing, uh, and also to solve uh, nonlinear problems, and so uh, I got you know somewhat close to the creativity of film, the film world, but not, uh, not in it. So when you, um, how did you get to be, I mean, when we worked together a number of years ago, um, you were the uh, managing director at Landor in New York City. I was out in Cincinnati. Um, you obviously, Landor New York is probably one of the most penultimate agencies in the world. And so that's an incredibly prestigious prestigious role and you did amazing work there how did you how did you get there a lot of people wonder like how people get to where they you know when they reach that pinnacle how did how did that happen well i think it's 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 more like a game of pinball than it is uh, when i was uh, at 19 years old i put a dot on the map and said new york branding landor um i started um in more of a general marketing business i was a unilever which okay. is like png and colgate uh, and I was in brand management for many years, um, worrying about how to convince you to use one soap or the other or, or one dishwashing liquid over the other. And it was a pretty good place to learn marketing because, uh, although I don't want to say this publicly, uh, you might have to edit this out. You know, there wasn't that much difference between one detergent and the other. Right. You know, they both cleaned your clothes. And to get somebody to buy one versus the other detergent, you really had to think about marketing and branding and because the product performance um, was 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 hard to differentiate. You couldn't wash a shirt one day and get a white shirt and wash it with another brand and get a gray shirt most of the time. Anyway, so after doing that for a number of years, it, it became you know it was a great training ground because uh, it was marketing related. And Unilever uh, was lucky enough to have lots of the world's greatest communications and branding and agencies uh, working for it. So I got a chance to to meet people from BBDO and from uh, Interbrand and from research firms and PR. Uh, after that, I uh, decided I had more fun on the creative side, closer to the creative. Most of my day, you know, Libra was not spent worrying about creative problems. It was worried about manufacturing uh, delays or uh, uh, cost of good reductions or sales strategy. It was all good training, but it was only a creativity was only a small portion of my day. So I went uh, to the advertising business um, and worked uh, for many years with P and G as my biggest client, which. Uh, got me to Cincinnati uh, multiple times, which is ultimately how uh, 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 Landor Cincinnati came to be. Uh, we, were, we were working for Procter & Gamble. After doing advertising for a while, I moved over to, to Landor because I liked Landor's ability to have a phenomenal diversity in problems you solve. 
you know, when I was in the P&G business, my whole life became Dawn dishwashing liquid for many, many years, which was a great training ground. But that was my life. That was a vertical. But uh, when I was lucky enough to join Landor, I could spend the morning on one dishwashing liquid and I could spend the afternoon on an insurance company and I could spend the next day on a, uh, you know, aircraft manufacturer and the third day on an airline. So it allowed me to... Um, touch many more businesses and get across categories and as as your listeners know and as you know um lots of innovation is just looking a little bit right or left and saying well, you know what are they doing in the in the detergent category that might be relevant in the toothpaste category that might be relevant in in air air travel um and so uh that led me to uh to landor and uh, and our relationship with proctor ultimately required us to establish um a significant office in Cincinnati because um, their needs required um, on the on the ground expertise and the agility you get back before Zoom <laughs> in being able to just you know pop over to the client's office and hang out for five minutes and talk to people and then go back to your office and figure things out. I, I, I think if Zoom was around when when we were grappling with how to service Procter and Gamble back in the day. Uh, you, you may not have worked at uh, Cincinnati, yeah. <laughs> Land or Cincinnati. You probably would have been home on a Zoom call. <laughs> right. One of the things um, I, I I talk about a lot is that when agencies are working with their clients, a lot of times it feels like we are the best part of their day, meaning they're spending most of their time, you know, manufacturing problems, spreadsheets, projections, things mm-hmm. like that. But right. then they get to be creative with us. And right. a lot of companies, agencies bristle at the fact that, you know, their their clients want to get creative. They want to get their thumbprint on everything. And I try to impress upon people that we are the funnest part of their day. They really want right. to be able to do what we do. And so right. it sounds like you kind of like you understood that. You made that jump from in-house, you mm-hmm. know, um, mm-hmm. client side to agency side because we get so much variety and because we get right. to, to work with so many different categories. Exactly. Um, and yes, it, when I was at Unilever, yeah, many meetings were less fun where we were looking at uh, uh, you know, reducing our cost of goods sold and lots of Excel spreadsheets. But when the agency came in and we were uh, talking about a new commercial we were going to do for, for Dove or whatever the brand, uh, then there would be casting tapes and there'd be script discussions and uh, you know design it discussions. It was fun. But um, you know, the challenge, of course, is to, uh, if you're a client or even if you're on the agency side, is to involve your client, but don't get to the illusion that if they have spent 20 years inside the client, they are going to be magically able to make creative judgment. What's hard mm-hmm. about creative decisions is that they're, it's usually not black and white. They're usually not exact right or wrong answers or their judgment calls. And clients get used to, when you're in a client world, you get used to adding up the numbers, as I said earlier, and saying, this is 45, that's 22, let's go there. Everything is very analytical, everything is very linear. Uh, But when you apply that same um, method of operation to creativity and say, you know, I want to cast Debbie because I think that's 22.6% better than casting Susan, um, it doesn't work. In fact, if you just follow linear thinking, you end up with content and creativity and um, branding and marketing that's ineffective. And, you know, both of us having worked with P&G and other companies that are very, very analytical when it comes to evaluating um, what they're doing in their businesses, how did you leverage what you had learned at Unilever and in-house on the client side when it came to trying to channel your clients on the agency side? went to get them to understand that the importance of that non-analytical aspect well to some extent uh you you have to realize as as you said that you know telling the clients they can't get in the sandbox and have some fun when they've been looking forward to this meeting all week is a non-starter you've got to let them in the sandbox you look out and to some extent you let them try to do it um and realize that while they think everyone thinks they're creative and everyone thinks they can do anything uh, and the more successful you are in business, the more confident you are that you can do everything. Um, uh, you know, let them experiment a bit and find out exactly how hard it is to do. Um, and then, um, 
you know, I think the other thing is just listen. Don't try to say, oh, Phil, it's, you know, you have no idea what you're talking about. And, you know, you, you know, just that's interesting. Let me think about that. Um, I, I want to share another idea with you. Have you thought about, you know, doing a podcast? Uh, yeah, so so it's, it is being more understanding to where you started, which is being being successful in most businesses like Landor and advertising and any service business. I think, you know, the mission critical skill is, is just being a good observer of what goes on and a good listener. Because even if somebody says, oh, I sort of like that, but if their face says, I would never do that, or they're looking like a deer in headlights, you know, just because they sort of like it doesn't mean, you know, you're ever going to, it's ever going to go from the, the page to the marketplace. One of the things uh, I'd love to touch base with you about is that you're one of actually the first people on the agency side that I ever really recognized as actively pursuing building their own personal brand while you were inside the agency. So you've always written books and you've established you know, yourself as a thought leader by, by writing. And you were doing that while you were at Landor. You're still doing that as you've you know, started your own consultancy. And can you talk a little bit about why you kind of started to do that? Was there, a, was there a purpose around it in terms of establishing some sort of an entity that was outside of the company that you were working for? Or was it more related to just your interest in, in the subjects? It was, as in many things in life, it was never just one thing. The one was a business need. Uh, Lander was in a business that if I called you up and said, gee, I think it's time you change your look and feel and identity and freshened up a bit, you know, y people say, well, thank you very much for that call, but we're fine. <laughs> you know, so if we were in the business that people had to call you to say, hey, I'm, I think I'm a little stodgy and irrelevant and can you help us reposition ourselves and make us better? So once you're in a position of people having to call you, uh, they have to find out about you. And uh, we at Landor had just recently been acquired by a large holding company agency called Young and Rubicam. And the CEO of, of YNR said, gee, you know, Alan, um, you know, you're, 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 you're doing pretty well in Landor, New York, but you know, all your competitors, I read the Wall Street Journal, and there's Alan Siegel of Siegel Gale, and there's the Lippincott people being quoted. And, you know, where are you, Alan? You know, we'd love to have you, you know, do better, but I don't see you when I when I read the newspaper. In, in those days, people actually read a newspaper. And so um, it became clear that if I wanted to uh, succeed at Landor, at least succeed in the mind of the people who own Landor, that if I wasn't in the news when IBM split into two or uh, somebody bought somebody else and I wasn't quoted once in a while, uh, I was off the radar. And if I was off the radar, Landor was off the radar because we had to be part uh, of, you have to be sort of top of mind aware. So if somebody says, gee, I'm, I think we're sort of irrelevant, I need to speak to a, a branding and an identity expert, at least we were on the list of firms that you would think about. So it became clear that I need to get out there. And of course, you call up um, the Wall Street Journal and say, hey, I'm, I'm in Orlando, New York, do you want to talk to me? And you get a dial tone. Dial tone is what you used to have on a landline. People hang but, up. No, yeah, right. and so it became clear I had to do something. The other thing that was happening is I, I would occasionally, you know, not get often pitch big assignments, and we in those days we didn't zoom in. We actually had to get in the elevator and go up to the big conference room, and and there would be you know with Landor you you would pitch something, and if you won it, it would be two or three or five years or more worth of work, and if you lost it, it was nothing. It was truly a winner-take-all game. And I go into the conference room, and on the side of the uh, table, I would see some of my competitors' books. And I realized that, you know, I just finished, and then right there on the coffee table is a book by this CEO or this brand expert or this ad expert. And I realized that I, you know, yeah, and of course, most of the time the book was there, that firm... <laughs> ended up you know, winning that little race, uh, mm. not all the time. So I realized that to, to really succeed in Landor's business and the consulting business, you had to have some thought leadership, you had to be out there. And uh, I remember going to uh, the, the team at Landor and say, I wanna write a book. And they go, no, we, we, don't, we don't have time to write a book. What do you mean write a book? I said, look, our key competitors write a book. You know, and they said, fine, go do it. 
and um, it was harder to do than uh, than I thought. Uh, but once I had it, it solved the first two problems I talked about. All of a sudden, I was getting more calls from the media. Did you see that GE is splitting in two? What's going to happen? What do you think? Is it a good idea? You see Facebook's new name. Is that good or bad? Um, and uh, when I went to a meeting, I would sometimes have one of my team, you know, leave one of my books on the uh, on the coffee table, so that after the meeting, it would be, well, they, you know, they were pretty good. And by the way, that team has some interesting thinking. So, as a writer and about branding and marketing, you, I would say that of the people out there, you probably have your finger on the pulse a lot better than most and so because mm -hmm. you because you write you always have your radar up for those sorts of changes and those sea changes that are happening in in the world of branding and and uh, business what are the sea changes that you're seeing right now what are some of the trends or major uh, paradigm shifts that are affecting what businesses are doing in marketing or branding you know i i uh, i think that's a, a great lead-in because uh, staying connected to what what's going on in the market or talking to people and getting out of your bubble is the most important criteria for success mm. in in many businesses but certain landowners and landowners business and certain cre uh, creative businesses I remember my first interview out of school was uh, with a large agency and uh, at Ogilvy and I remember going through the interviews and being ready to talk about marketing and media strategy and and the CEO sat me down and I knew that was a final interview and I was in the big office and uh, he looks at me, I'm ready to answer the market segmentation question. I have all my answers ready to go. And he goes, so uh, Alan, you've had a good day. You like, what you, yeah. Uh, so tell me about the last book you read, the last movie you've seen and the last play you went to and what you learned from those three things. And of course I was not ready for that question and I, I somehow mumbled through it. But I asked him afterwards uh, why he wanted that uh, question to be the, the decider if he was going to bring somebody onto the team at Ogilvy or not. And it was because he felt the role of an agency, the role of a creative, the role of a designer is to be the client's eyes and ears, to see mm -hmm. what's going on. I'm going to come to your, your question in a second. And you know, if, you, if you're just worrying about the soap business or the tuna fish business, you might be an expert in tuna fish, but you, you, know, you need to see what's going on. So I think, uh, to, to bring it around to where you were, what's, what's happening is the world is changing so fast, and most clients uh, have their nose in their emails or on their screen, and are looking, if they're experts in anything, they're experts in what they did yesterday, and they're not approaching the world with any sort of wide-angle lens or peripheral vision. So, you know, I, you know, I think part of the challenge marketers have today is that by the time and this was the subject of my last book, Shift Ahead, by the time sales start going down and the core pe people aren't buying the, your, your, your dry cleaning service, your, your consulting service, it's uh, often too late. And, you know, you didn't see it coming because you're so focused on what's right in front of your nose. And as everyone knows, disruption does not come, competitors don't come right in front of you. <laughs> often times they come from the side or from behind. And so one of the key skills is to ability to zoom out, uh, to be able to manage change faster, because certain categories change faster than others. And if you, if you can zoom out, um, seeing change in time to react to it is one of the challenges across categories. Uh, and most companies uh, think they're agile and will change, but most people are comfortable in, uh, in the old TV show, Frasier's... Um, dad's chair um <laughs> you know in the, in the lazy boy lounger and you know they just want you know they're comfortable with the familiar and the familiar is what they did yesterday and yesterday worked fine it ain't broke don't fix it and that sort of mentality uh in a fast-changing world is more detrimental than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago so a little while back in the conversation you were talking about the difference between your calling a company and saying hey, your brand is looking a little stale or, you know, you may be in need of a refresh and then working for a company like Landor that didn't have to really, for the most part, make those calls. People called Landor because of their reputation, et cetera. Right. But in terms of doing business development when you are not a Landor 
Is that a, an approach which you would recommend where you are out there looking at businesses who are, you know, you recognize that they may be someone that you could help or that you are recognizing that their website's a little lame or their brand identity is a little dated and to call them up and make that recommendation or do some sort of a competitive audit that shows them that they're, they're not up to snuff at the moment. Um, is that something that you would recommend that people do? Is that a good approach for business development today? I think, yeah, I think that's the only approach that works. Really? Uh, because uh, even in Landor's day, when people called up and said, oh, I, I, you know, I, I saw something Landor did in the news and it's interesting, can you come talk to me? If I go in there and say, oh, let me tell you more about that and let me just talk about what, how great Landor is. You know, you always have to go in there with an eye towards uh, and if you, if they don't call you, the, the the way to get a meeting, it's never easy. But is I've done some, or we've done some thinking about your business. We see some opportunities. We see some challenges. We see we have some suggestions to share with you. And going in and starting to talk about their business, and saying, look, here's here's what we see. Are you doing really well? But here are three opportunities. You know, I'm sure you know about them. But let me show you. Um, what we what question marks we have, and you know you do look like your father's Oldsmobile, and you know you look a little stuffy. But you you have to go in with, and you know here's one idea or two ideas that you might think about, not fully formed, but you might think about X or Y. So if you don't go in with thinking, no one wants to see today. No one wants to see if you're in if if the if they take the meeting, they have bought the fact that you've got some good experience. And if they want to find out about you, they'll find out as much as they want on social media, on the website, and whatever else. So going in there and saying, well, look at the great work I've done. Here's what we did for BP, and here's what we did for, uh, for uh, P&G. You know, if you start there, you know, you probably end there. Yeah, so I think that that's a point very well taken. You can't just walk in, get the meeting, and then walk through your credentials slide deck. You really have to go in mm -hmm. with some sort of a, a recommendation about something that they should do. Um, when, you, when, and when you're writing your books, you do a lot of um, reporting, essentially, about what's happening with some major brands and major companies about decisions they've made, whether that was smart or not, com A, B, comparing other uh, companies to each other. Do you ever in those books make um, make those sort of recommendations or those sort of observations that might be leading in a business development kind of way that you could utilize when you go in to talk to some of those companies or lead them to come to you and say, hey, we noticed that, you know, comment you made in the book about what we were doing and we were, you know, wondering whether this is something you might be able to help us with. You know, uh, lately I've been able to do more of that. One of the challenges of working for a... Um a large holding company the lender was owned by a large uh, WPP is that if I went and wrote a book and said I don't think Philip's doing this podcast right and he's <laughs> you know the sound is not good and you know he's talking about subjects that I don't you know ultimately uh, somebody in WPP had Philip as a client and I would get a, get a call saying what are you doing <laughs> criticize so I tended to keep it positive um um and, and but now I, I also don't think it's helpful to tell people what they're doing wrong, but I think it's better to say, here's a good idea. You know, this company should, you know, if, if I were in the railroad business, I would be doing, you know, here are three things I would look at. If I were, you know, in the toothpaste business, here are some things I'd be thinking about uh, rather than, you know, going right after the, you know, uh, uh, what's wrong and it, you know by showing the the positive most people will realize aspiration yeah, you create aspiration I'm, I'm com yeah i'm completely irrelevant i better call phil up and maybe he'll help me so tell us a little bit about the the pivot you've made now in starting metaphors what is it how does metaphors different differ from you know being an md at a at a large global agency and uh, are you refocusing on what you're what what you're offering or kind of what you're bringing to clients? Yeah, you know, so without giving your listeners too much of a madman history story. Uh, in oh, the I'm sure they'd love that, actually. So <laughs> in the in the olden days, and if you watch Mad Men, it's actually go go back and force yourself to watch an episode. But 
you know, the client would go to an agency, whatever Don Draper's agency was, and I don't remember what it was, the name of it, and they would sit down and talk about their business. If it was a hotel chain or a hamburger chain, and the agency would be solving all sorts of problems, from the advertising to the packaging to what you called it, to the in-store merchandising to the, you know. So they were they were looking at the they were look, listening to the client, and usually it was a senior client going in, the CEO of the company, that, and they were they were the marketing arm. They were the ones who were going to help you, not just. You know, I have an ad for you, or I have a digital campaign for you, or I have an influencer campaign. And what happened over the years was, within large agencies, uh, you know, everything got sliced into very small swim lanes. So if you wanted to talk about influencers, there was a firm doing influencers. If you wanted to talk about wayfinding, there was a wayfinding firm or, or a social media firm. Or um, and it became hard to solve problems horizontally or look at things and say, look, if you could only do three things. What should you do? And so everyone was in their business of if you went to an ad agency, you would get an ad as a solution. If you went to a PR firm, the answer was always PR. If you went to Landor, often the, the answer was design or, or strategy, brand strategy. You know, you know, rarely would Landor say, you know, your identity's fine, your branding's fine, your design's fine, but I think your influencer strategy is wrong. <laughs> you know, let us help you with that. Um, and so yeah, part of what I wanted to do in this chapter uh, at Metaphors is to zoom back to the future, <laughs> go back to the future, uh, and zoom out over the swim lanes and be able to sit down with Phil and say, look, I've been thinking about your podcast. And, you know, I think here are three things that might be issues. And you might need to do an ad campaign. You might need to do some design work. You might need... But then uh, when I suggested those, bring in those players and because the other thing that goes on is that um, averages over. It used to be if you did an okay job, you know, you could, you know people would watch your commercials. And but today, average is completely so. If you're better off doing three things extraordinarily well than doing five things less well. <laughs> um, so the metaphors model was, you know, first diagnose the problem, figure out what needs to get done, and figure out a few things. And then bring a then bring the world class experts and teams and creatives and strategists and researchers in to solve it. And it was solving the problem that existed within large agency holding companies where everyone claimed to do everything, and getting teams to really work well together across agencies was really hard to do culturally, really hard financially. To do. Yeah, that yeah. was one of the stories that you know we used to tell at Landor is that you know. We're a global agency, WPP. We have agencies that do everything from social to PR, all special right. niche agencies, and we can bring any of them to bear to your problem. But right. the problem was is a lot of them don't – there's a lot of territorialism. They don't necessarily right. want to work with each other. They all want to win right. all the work, you know, so there's right. a lot of arm and wrestling. Was, and it, yeah, it was one of my favorite things that when I would uh, talk to teams at Land or at WPP. If you went into a large WPP – cross agency meeting and you asked 50 people in the audience from great agencies and great PR firms and great digital firms, you know, who's the brand expert? You know, everyone's hand came up, <laughs> you know, who does great brand design? Everyone's hand came up. And so it was really hard to, cause everyone, you know, that was just sort of like, you know, who, who, who drinks water? <laughs> and so, <clears throat> Uh, and if everyone's an expert, no one really is an expert. You know, you're, you're, yeah. And so uh, that that is a, you know, the, the flip side is, you know, back in the days when Don Draper did it, you know, they, they probably didn't have as strong a design department or a research department or a uh, direct, which is now digital department. You know, they probably still were ad centric because Don liked to get up and, you know, sell the big campaign that would be on television. But, um, you know, um, they were closer to it uh, because they tended to focus on the problem first, knowing they, no matter what problem they identified, they had the capabilities and the skill set, certainly more than their competitors and more than the client to solve that problem. So you're, you're bringing up a very important point, I think, in the agency world, which is the kind of the, 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 the generalist versus niching down challenge mm -hmm. right so yeah. do you try to offer as broad of a v-shaped offering as you can or do you 
go T-shaped and go really, really deep and niche down into a specific um, capability set and just market that as deeply as possible. And it sounds like with Metaforce, to a certain extent, you're bringing those teams or you're architecting those sorts of teams, those niche teams together to solve the problem as closely as possible. Is that is that what you're, you're yeah, doing? Yeah, I think, yeah, I, was, I think. I think that's the the basic idea. I, st- strong brands are about focus, and strong skills are about focus. If you're, you know, if you're going to re- remodel your house, and you have a person come up and say, "Well, I, I do basements, and I do uh, farmhouses, and I do factories," um, versus if you're remodeling your house, and somebody says, "You know, let me do your kitchen. I'm a kitchen expert, and I know exactly how to." You know, you, you're going to hire the expert. You're not going to hire the person that watch a YouTube video on how to build a house. So I think, you know, my role and perhaps at this stage of my career is more of an architect and assembling the right experts, a general contractor. Uh, but for anyone starting out, rather than try to be great at everything uh, or good at everything, try to be great at one thing or two things. You know, really, because focus in business drives success, focus in brands drives success. Uh, so be first, first win the lane you're in and no matter what that is, and be the best at that, because that will open up more opportunities. Because if you're not the best at that, you know, people aren't looking to you and saying, "Well, you, you're, you're okay at, at building homes, not very good." But let me let me have you build a really big home for me. <laughs> I'm sure you'll be better at that, and it's probably not the case. So, for agencies that are niche agencies, is it best for them to find a general contractor or develop some sort of relationships with agencies like yours and mine who put together teams like that, um, or is it better for them to go to try to go direct to the client or find a client that is in need of their particular niche? Yeah, I think you start off by saying, "Look, you know, you want to go in and you know, Landor did best if if the client." valued and thought brand and identity and design was a business driver. And in fact, the whole P&G relationship happened way back when, uh, because unlike other companies, as you know, P&G you know, felt that design and branding and identity and packaging were under leveraged. Uh, and, you know, they decided to say, look, we, we, let us let us find the best resource there. Um, to, uh, that can be a differentiator in, in categories that are hard to sort apart. Uh, so I think you're better off winning the, the specific job and then having the conversation, can I help you on more? Because you'll be credible. You saw, you built the best kitchen in my home and you did a spectacular job. Now maybe I'll let you do a, you know, a shelving system for my garage. Uh, I might because you did such a good job in the kitchen. But if you if you didn't do a great job in the kitchen, and then you say, "Look, can I help you shelve your garage or re, reshingle your roof?" Forget it. <laughs> now you can't you know you can't go from everything. If you're very niche, you can't go and say, "Look, I'm I'm an expert at you know this, and now can I do that?" But you know, I think in business today, identify something you're great at, focus on that, deliver that, and that will lead to more opportunities and trying to say, oh, I can do that too, or let me try that, or, you know, you know the, more, the, the, the more you say you can do, the less credible you are. So you've had, you've experienced some incredible success in your career. You've had multiple very successful books, teaching it and why you Stern, Landor. What kind of challenges have you had in your career? Where have you kind of met an obstacle and how have you had to get over that? Um, that's a great question because, you know, you, when you look back, it looks like it's all, oh, you did this and then that. And as you know, um, you learn more from stubbing your toe or running into a wall or, you know, finding out. And, um, you know, the obstacles I think right now are the same as they've been in many parts of my career where, uh, if you don't have the right team, the talent, um, because you know, usually I'm not the one that, you know, if, if you hired me to do design work, you'd be bankrupt before the podcast is over. You know, so part of my ability to succeed is my ability to bring folks that are far more talented um, 
and enthusiastic uh, and can work together to, to focus on a problem. So, you know, when I've been, you know, struggled before is when I was not surrounded with people who were more talented uh, than I was. Uh, so, and finding that today is, is as difficult as it was, it's always been hard. So, you know, I can, uh, you know, how do you, and finding new talent and finding talent that, that uh, can solve a problem is, is, is challenging. So, um, so I, I still enjoy it. And part of what keeps me motivated every day is when somebody says, look, we've got this problem and this pen is not writing anymore. If people remember what a pen is. Um, and, you know, of course, somebody will say, did you, did you, did you, did you just stick it in gum or something or let me look <laughs> at it? But, you know, how do you solve that problem? I, I love talking to clients about difficult problems that, you know, don't have obvious solutions um, because that requires you to think creatively differently uh, and um, it's it's, uh, it, it's uh, easier said than done so where how do you find your specialist partners now how do you people get on your radar in terms of being someone you would call on if you needed a PR agency or a direct agency or a packaging agency is that just accumulated I, I, knowledge of your your years in the industry or are you a, a piece a piece of that is that a piece of it is you know if i need a influencer expert oh i didn't work with a lot of them earlier in my career because influencers uh, I'll, I'll start networking i'll start you know calling companies that i know are, who did who do you use to to figure out how to do this and who do you recommend and um because word of mouth still matters <laughs> more than ever uh and so um, um but you know i i find it um always the biggest challenge when somebody asks me to solve a creative problem and i don't have the right person available and or know it you know finding that person is uh is difficult um but usually I, I, I start with asking around and say, who did, you know, who do you use when you had this problem? Uh, so referrals still matter. And to get referrals goes back to what we talked about before. If you do an average job, no one's going to say, if, you know, oh, you should hire Phil because he did okay. <laughs> you know, it, it, the, the world of referrals is driven by, you know, people say, how do you get word of mouth? How do you get, you know, how do you break right. through on social media? No one shares the ordinary. Yeah. You're only going to share, uh, you know, I worked with Phil and it was, you know, a terrible experience. Don't ever work with him again. Or I work with Phil and it was magical. Right. You know, so if, if Phil just does an okay job and checks all the boxes, you know, he will be invisible in the word of mouth business. So you, you know, if you're going to screw up, screw up big, in which case you'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll find yourself in another business. But if you want to succeed in our business, I think you have to figure out how to make sure when you work with somebody, they are wowed. Wowed because you did something extra, wowed because you surprised them, wowed because you're incredibly talented, wowed because you did all of that. But in a word of mouth business today, you know, I go back to what I said, average is over even more so. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to figure out, uh, um, you know, I, one of the, you ask about the books, and one of the things I like most about doing books is if I would call you up and I say, look, can I talk to you about how to do a podcast? You go, Alan, I'm really busy uh, and, you know, my branding is okay, but thank you very much. But if I call you up and say, look, you've done a great podcast, but I'd like to interview you for my book. I'm talking about how to keep podcasts relevant. Then you might say, oh, yeah, let's do a talk. And so what I find is when I call people up and say, can I talk to you about a book? I, I get lots of people who want to chat with me. And the more people I talk with, the more I learn. Oh, and it, it's, uh, it's, 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 um, self-fulfilling. But one of the, one of the people I was lucky enough to talk with for one of my books was, uh, Tom Friedman, uh, the economist from the times. And, you know, he talked about, uh, one of his stories he loves to tell is that when he went to his international house of pancakes, whatever, um, uh, in Minneapolis when he was growing up or earlier in his career, he talked about how, there was always someone who knew exactly what he liked and gave him a little extra whipped cream and put a cherry on his pancake. Did that little piece of extra thing. 
it wasn't in the job description for the for the for the waiter to to put the cherry on the top but you know they, they did that little extra uh, and you know his view is that to succeed in in anything today everyone has to do that little extra because just doing what's expected won't get you noticed mm. so one of the things that we always have to deal with as branding and agency people is is new channels or whatever is hot and interesting you know you'll you'll get a client calling you up and say you know tiktok's it right what are we going to do about tiktok what can you tell us about tiktok or you know clubhouse mm. is just on the scene and we have to do something on clubhouse what should we do on clubhouse how do you counsel your clients when they are chasing that new hot thing that's a great question and it's 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 always been the case uh, for years that everyone it's sort of like watching seven or eight year olds play soccer everyone's around the ball no one's on defense no one's on, you know. so you know when tiktok comes out you know everyone say you know talk to me about tiktok or talk to me and you know uh, the, it's hard to, to manage that other than the fact that um the, the basic principles are still the same how you succeed on tiktok is the same as how you s succeed on facebook or social media that you still have to be a good storyteller you still have something relevant to share um and great content and great creative breaks through. You could post something on TikTok. Oh, you can, and as you, as you undoubtedly know, um, no one will see it except you. <laughs> Part of success is how do you, how do you, if you want to be on TikTok, how do you tell your story in a way that's going to get noticed? And if you look at all the successes for online videos, all the way from Dollar Shave Club and before that, it's always someone who takes a quirky, fresh, doesn't follow the formula, doesn't do what the last four people have done, does something different to break through. So thank you so much for speaking to us, Alan. I always end my interviews with one question, and I usually hip my interviewees to what this question is, and I don't know that you probably got the memo in time because you scheduled so quickly, but... Do you have a personal manifesto or some sort of mantra that you try to live your life by? Um, probably not. Other than, you know, um, if you're having fun at what you do, you will be more successful. I try to successful over time than if you hate it. So I try to make sure every day I'm having, I, I, I enjoy what you, you have to enjoy what you do. And if you don't enjoy, then try to figure out how to make it fun, look at the glass half full, uh, or try to do something else. Because I think of my best ideas while I'm running in the park or walking, and um, y y you have to love what you do. And if you love what you do, you'll be more successful at it. And I, 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 I love creativity and business problem solving. And so that has helped me throughout the years. And you can totally tell. And if anyone's interested, um, Alan writes incredible books, and I'm going to name them again. Brand Simple, Brand Digital, The Edge, and Shift Ahead, all available on Amazon.com, I'm sure. And um, Alan, if people wanted to get in touch with you or with Metaforce, how, what's the best way to do that? Probably an email, alan at metaforce.com. Awesome. Well, thank you, Alan, so much for joining us on the Brand Design Masters podcast. I really appreciate your coming and sharing your experience and uh, your history and your knowledge with us. Thanks for inviting me. And of course, thanks also for designing such a great book cover for The Edge. Ah, uh, yes. Well, I'm going to show that because we are on YouTube, too. And I'll just... Mm -hmm. The Edge, 50 tips from brands that lead happen to just design this cover for Alan and thank you so much for asking me to design it. <laughs> no, no, it's because you were incredibly talented and were recommended to me by word of mouth. Oh, so. there you go. Word of mouth. Well, Alan, thanks a lot. And, um, again, we hope we have you back on the show soon. Take care. Thanks okay. for inviting me.